What's up, everybody? It's Reggie Williams, founder and CEO of Ambrosia for Heads. And with me, I have Jake Payne, our editor-in-chief. And together, this is our What's the Headline podcast. I am crazy, crazy, crazy excited today because I got one of my favorite artists of all time on the line with us today. Uh, this man is a pioneer of West Coast rap. He is part of not one, but not two, not three, but three of the greatest rap labels in history. I'm not going to qualify it by region or territory because that's just facts. This man is part of NW and the Posse. He helped kick off Ruthless Records. He helped kick off Death Row Records and Aftermath too. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about one of the most lethal pens in hip hop, one of the greatest to ever do it. In fact, some would say no one can do it better. Welcome to the DLC. Hey, yes, that was too fucking. <laughs> I that one. That felt pretty good. Thank you. Thank you, brother. God bless you for it. My man. All heartfelt. All heartfelt. I have been a fan since day one. Uh, you know, love your work, love your pen, and really, really honored to have you on this show with us, you know. So, you know, I want to kick it off. So uh, rumor is it that you have been on stage recently. Is that right? Have you perform been performing? Yeah, man, I did uh there's a uh, there's a punk rock guy. His name is Fat Mike. He belongs to a band called uh, No Effects, mm -hmm. and uh, he allowed me to shoot some of my documentary in his house. And uh, he's a really cool dude. Like he's funny, you know. He's like just cool. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to do a song with him. And he asked me to do a, a verse. On a, uh, on an album he was doing with some guys called the Co-Defendants, and uh, I listened to the guys, and they would they both had great voices, they both sounded great, so I thought it would be a cool mix, and so I did it. But I didn't I didn't think people was gonna be feeling it like they feeling it, you know. Now these boys got me flying all over the place, rapping that song on stage, and it's actually kind of cool if I'm being honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I must feel amazing, right? Did you, you, how long has it been since you performed before that? Man, 30, 33. Uh, almost 33 years, bro. Wow. Wow. What was it, DOC, about Fast Ones that felt worthy to deliver, you know, what I would call as a fan of yours, your biggest verse, certainly in the last 20, since the Deuce album? Bro, I like Mike. The guy has me to think, you know what I'm saying? It's pretty simple. I think the guy's a good guy, and he's a good producer. He's got a great ear, and he loves his work like Dre, like my guy. You know, he's one of those kind of guys, you know, and and I create well with those kind of people. So really, that's what it was. It's a good mix. Hmm. So on that song, Fast Ones, one of the things you said that stuck out to me was, I was when it was used to be attitudes. Now it's just a menstrual black fist, black fools, clowns, and blackface. You know, in the early days of gangster rap, going all the way back to Schooly D and Ice T, there was often a message with the madness. You know, when do you, when and why do you think that went away? You know, I, if, if I'm being honest, bro, I'd have to say marketing and promotion of the machine. And, and, uh, you know, us allowing, it to tell us what good hip hop is, you know, what was dope, what's what should be moving the moving the the, the needle. You know, we let it slip through our fingers. It, it really should have been hard on us to maintain a, a better sense of control over this medium, because you know we owe it to these kids. We 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 kind of let it get out of hand, and that's why we are where we are now. Hmm. That's heavy. You know, kind of going back to that question I asked you, you know, DOC, like there were times when we covered it on Ambrosia for Heads, but you would appear on songs a little bit over the last few years. You did one with the chill from Compton's Most Wanted. You did another, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, Bishop Lamont. Like you would lend your voice different places, but this one you went all in. And I'm just curious, you know, especially just over the last 10 years. Did you ever feel like it's evident, even in the lines that Reggie just quoted, like you have some amazing things to say. Did you ever feel like you were holding back from going all in with a verse like this? 
No, bro, I'm, I, I, I've come to an understanding here in, in the past three years where it's sort of a spiritual kind of awakening. It's probably the best way I could put it mm. that I understand now is really a G.O.D. thing. And so I had no idea that folks was going to love that verse. I just, the guy asked me to do it. I did it in about 10 minutes on the way to the studio, wow. bro. And, you know, um, and that's what ended now. I only laid it once. Wow. And the guy wouldn't let me do it again. So is it safe to say amid this awakening that, you know, you might be inclined to give fans some more of these verses soon? Absolutely. If they want it, they can have it. I'm not, trust me, I am not opposed to, uh, you know, getting down. You know, I, for me, it's always been a question of people not liking my voice at that at least that's what it felt like to me. And so it made me not, not want to, you know, disappoint folks or, mm. or push that line, you know? Well, as somebody who bought Helter Skelter the year you dropped it, pay, you know, bought it new. I think I can speak on behalf of the fans. We want more. We want it. So, uh, you know, okay. salute. I, co- you, I co-sign that. You know, I got to ask you, was it being a punk record? Would, would that take some of the pressure off? Uh, no, I just approached the record the same, you know, dope, you, you want dope, I just write what comes out, yeah. and I had, I had no, uh, you know, these are messages that are inside me that I'm trying to, and I'm trying to say, and punk rock allows you to, to be vocal like that, and so it was, it was kind of a perfect fit. Yeah. You know, back in 2018, we saw a clip that Erica, your friend and co-parent and, you know, um, person who's very much in your life, posted uh, of you singing Earth, Wind and Fires after the love is gone. And it was like mind blowing. How, how were you able to sing like that? Well, if I can, if I squeeze, like if I pull muscles really hard with my throat and make the tone, it's just not something I could sustain. But I was going through a phase that that something was telling me to, to push, you know. Uh, um, but that's not something I could do over a long period of time. Mm. I just wanted to show if I do, I could do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, over the last few months, we've seen a revolution with AI, you know, where seemingly the impossible is possible. You got, you know, Tupac rapping Biggie, Biggie verses and vice versa. So how do you feel about that technology and what do you see as possibilities for yourself? Bro, that, that's a super interesting question. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have to be honest and say, even since I've heard it, I've, I've dreamed a little bit about what it could sound like, you know, what I would feel like to hear that dude rap again. Mm. Um, but I, but I would only be invested in it if if I knew he could be what he what he was, you know. Oh. I, I feel like Dre. I don't I don't want him to be Sully, you know. But I sure wouldn't mind trying. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Have you started playing with it at all yet? No, bro. I got this documentary at, um, that I'm trying to get to, to, in, in the right space, and really, bro, the documentary is the key. On Earthstone, it's the first domino to everything. Mm. I mean, uh, the next 10 years of my life is in this documentary. Wow. Um, and so I'm holding on so tightly to it because in the year of hip hop, bro, in this year, this, this, this documentary was a gift to me, a gift to you. And I cannot allow it to be sullied by anybody. Mm. You know, I've always been the one to take the bullet for the cause. Mm. So why would I change who I am now? Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that people, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm gonna be solid all the way through this motherfucker, but I, I guarantee you this, when you see it, I can confidently say, it might be the best musical documentary you've ever seen. Mm. Wow, that's heavy. I remember last really? year, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying, I'm just saying real, real talk. You know what I mean? Mm. 
when you, I think you premiered it in 2022 at Tribeca, right? Yeah. And well, a friend of mine, Chad Kaiser, I remember him telling me about it. You know, he got to be at the screening with you and, and some of your folks. And he said, it, just what you said, it's incredible. And, you know, I hope, I, I respect so much that you're holding out for it to be in the right hands and the right platforms to properly put your story on the level it should be. I'm curious, you know, and, and, you know, we want to keep the cat in the bag, but is there something the medium of documentary film afforded you to show the public about yourself that an interview or a newspaper article or all the things that have covered you over the last 35 years were unable to in particular? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it was, it was, the revelation was happening as we were filming. Mm. Mm. Bro, the mother, bro, it, it, the motherfucker is crazy. I, I'm not, I'm not like, like, this shit moves people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel so blessed to have lived this life now. You know what I mean? And uh, it just took a while for it to make sense. But, you know, it's here. And then all of those things, you know, they haven't fallen into my lap yet. But I can feel them bitches coming. You know what I mean? Like all of these things that are happening, I didn't ask for any of it. This shit, this shit just started happening. You know. Mm. But I'm gonna take full advantage of it, enjoy it, because I know it's a gift from God. Now I know what to do with it. Get out there and do service with it. You know what I mean? It's these young boy, these young brothers and sisters in Dallas, Funky Town, Fort Worth, where I'm from. It's another me out there. It's another Eric Badu out there. It, it's time to get them prepared early, so they don't have to do what we had to what we had to do. And, and and it's time to start figuring out where the Barry Gordys are, and, and, and not just the Marvins and the and the little Easy and the Shugs, and, and correct their mindset before they get it put in that position. So when they get put in that position of power, they do the right thing. Mm. And we can do what we're supposed to do, bro. You know, but it's all a G-O-D thing, you know, and I'm blessed and grateful for all of it. Absolutely. You know, one of the questions you mentioned Dallas and Fort Worth right there and, and Reggie in that beautiful intro, you know, credited you on West Coast. I'm always curious, you know, how do you identify? Because I know you and the Feel of Fresh crew you know, you got on, you know, at least in the public size, for NWA and the posse, but you are a Southern pioneer at the same time, being from Texas, putting on, like, in telling your own story, do you swim in both of those waters, or do you feel you're underrepresented, underrepresented as a Southern artist, too? So I say, when I talk about this documentary, it's a, it's a love letter to hip-hop, mm -hmm. because it it's all of them, you know. It's not. It's not ones. It's all of them. It's just go through me, you know. I'm the guy that it gets to go through. But it's East Coast MCs. That's where this story comes from, you know. It's Southern swag. That's where it comes from, and it's West Coast gangster rap. That's where the story comes from. It's it's the it's the through line to everything you've seen. So it's gonna connect everything mm. that you've already seen. So I like that. You know, so one of the things you talked about was inspiring that next you, that next Erica, that next artist who's coming along, but making sure that they are in the, the right mindset so they can do the right thing when they get that position of power. You've coached a lot of artists over the years um, who become legendary songwriters themselves already, you know, but is there something you can trace to yourself that you instill in them? Is there like one, one kind of core thing or, you know, what are the, the general things that you kind of emphasize when you work with people? Well, really, it's, a, you know, I go back to the G.O.D. thing, like it's all I'm doing is, is my part in it. And to, like I'm just a coach. You know, that's what they, like, like Snoop was already Snoop Doggy Dog. I just helped him understand principles 
that will allow him to understand what he what he's really trying to do a little better. You know what I mean? Uh, beginning, middle, and end, writing a book with a in that in that four minutes, you know, and you know, just just literally the thinking. But what Snoop is concerned, he's just a charming guy, and you just got to be yourself. And that and that really stands true for everybody, you know. Mm. Um, Easy Eaton had a thing that made him the shit, but he had no no real talent to speak up, you know what I'm saying? But he had a thing that just made him the shit, made you want to emulate him. Mm. So just shine that up, you know what I mean? You're big on cadence too. I've I've seen interviews where you talk about that, right? It can't be just about you just saying the words with no regard for the beat. You gotta like be an ebb and flow and really kind of meld yourself to the track. You know, it's one thing to see a verse written out. It's another thing to actually understand how it's wrapped. How have you conveyed yeah. cadence when writing for others in the past? Well, that that your cadence is natural. It's it's yours. So. It's just about figuring out a way to make the sentence connect um, in that cadence. And, and that's your style. It, and it's natural to you. Everybody got one. You know, uh, it's the difference between uh, Method Man and Doggy Dog, who may be close to the slick brick. You know, like everybody's got their own little wavelength. And it's just about matching those words to that wavelength. Now, some people like him. They have a pattern where they could just speak the syllables of, 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 of those words in that pattern and, and connect their, their Legos that way. But essentially, that's all it is. Bars of Legos connected together in these ways. Uh, that's what makes it cool, at least to me. That's what makes it cool about, about a rapper doing this thing. But everybody's got a natural one. You uh, you brought up the fact that we are in the 50th year of hip hop as we celebrate it. And what you I'll say you have one of the best Twitter accounts out there. I'm not a huge Twitter guy, but like Crooked Eye, you know, you're always seeming to talk about hip hop, you know, and other things you like you really connect with your fans out there. So I got to ask you a question that inevitably you've been asked before. But and in a celebration year, you know, as we celebrate this culture, who are your top five dead or alive MCs? You know what? That's uh, that's that's really an, sort of an unfair question, uh, and and if I'm being honest, I just don't have an answer to that. I don't think that you can that you can really honestly ever a- answer that question because a lot of these guys are great, um, but we all stand on the shoulders of somebody else. You know what I mean? I, I said that there's similarities between Snoopy and and Slick Rick, you know, and so. Who's the great or the worst? What came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, it's like uh, we are we all the greatest of all times, and and we should continue to be that. You know, we should continue to stand on one another's shoulders and use this art form to connect us uh, in ways that we're not right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I would rather us all be the great, the greatest, and keep it like that. I really re- respect that answer a lot. As you and Reggie were talking about Caden, something dawned on me. You know, we covered it again on Ambrosia. But in a clip from the film, you know, Eminem is showing, flipping out about a line that you rapped from one of my favorite songs you did, Mind Blowing, that he never understood. And when you broke it down for him, Eminem looks at you and says, how, how the fuck did you say that? I'm curious to know, you know, as, as one of the greatest pens in hip-hop history, did you ever write lines or verses for other artists that they just couldn't quite get off properly like you could? All the time, bro. <laughs> All the time. Every fucking verse. <laughs> <laughs> they always fuck it up. They always fuck it up, you know. <laughs> but, but you gotta live with it. You know, if it feels good, let it go. Yeah. You know, with that said, uh, you we covered it also on the site, but I mean, you and Rakim have this great relationship, and I know in the past you've talked about someday getting in songs. And one of the things that Rakim has said is he's a student of jazz, and it's why his flow wasn't ABAB. It was, it was kind of like free jazz. And when I think of your flow at the exact same time, you know, 88, 89, 87, you have that. Like, you are not living within 
the confines. Do you know where that comes from? Are you a jazz head? Is it something else? Is it is it just how does your mind create those rhyme patterns that were so inventive? So I tell folks, I, I, I tell this to people all the time. What 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 makes my specific style, you know, is is in the song, the formula, the energy flowing with the with the sense of a rich man. Now listen to this. And those are, are rappers whose influences I use to develop me. High energy is run, run DMC. Uh, along with the wisdom is KRS one. Sense of a rich man is uh slick rate. Knowledge in the rhythm is uh rock them. That's the formula. That's mm -hmm. me. You know, that when you pour a little, then you add a little me in at the end. Uh, but you pour that in a cup in one of those little vast uh, vials, and uh, that's 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 my thing, you know. And so Rakim is in me. That's why it's in there. So as you, as uh, are one of the biggest influences, I would think, of people after you, Who's taken your formula and built it and mixed it up in ways that you could have could not have imagined? Man, I hear it all over the place. I hear it um, in in almost all of them, you know. To be to be honest with you, uh, um, but I I got mad at Biggie Smalls because I could hear what where I wanted to go, you know? mm. and he first came and I could hear where I wanted to go and couldn't do it. So it made me be angry with him, you know, before I met him. But when I met him, he was such a genuine dude. And he asked me to take a picture with him. And he was so fucking humble. And I was like, how can you hate it? I hate a dude like that. And, and ever since then, he's been my, you know, my number one, really. Hmm. That photo, it's it's you, him, and Craig Mack, is, am I right? Yeah, yeah. We were in Chicago at something. And it was so fair. And, Wow. And uh, Craig Mack and Smalls and myself. And he was just a cool dude, man, you know. That's amazing. Yeah, I know, I, I you know, I love to hear that story. You know, he went on record and said what an influence King T was. And that's another artist that, you know, I especially look up to. And I, I love hearing that. And it's cool how that changed your mind frame on the whole thing. Yeah, man, King T is another one that don't get a lot. You know, he had me in Dallas wearing my white gold chain. Um, Trying to be him, you know, before <laughs> I let my head on those guys. You know? Wow. So we all stand on each other's shoulders, bro. That's exactly what I mean. So you mentioned Dre. You know, Dre is definitely someone, and, and you said Biggie is where you wanted to go, but Dre, I think, also has taken, you know, given us a taste of where you would have gone to through his rap voice, you know, and he's got that booming voice, which I think has like really kind of resonated too. Who are some of the, the voices? Who are some of the other voices you'd want to hear um, rap your lines, whether whether or not you've worked with them? Man, that's that's a great question. That's a, I never heard of. And I wouldn't want to, you know, I consider myself a humble guy. And the people that I really Look up to. I wouldn't want them. I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want them rapping my words. Yeah, I feel like I was doing the justice here. Man. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Cool. The man is the one guy, and and, and he said something on an interview not too long ago. Though. But he's the one guy. My whole thing has always been: if I can, I can do it. If you do it. And I hear it, I can do it. Mm. As I judge. But Method Man was the one guy that I couldn't do his deal. Oh, wow. Mm. But I couldn't find the right verbiage to mm. fill it lots and do it like he do it. It's just, you know, it's dope. Wow. That's what's That's up. crazy. Yeah. You know, so. Go ahead. Over the years, we've heard a lot about, you know, the, the tough stories about Suge Knight, but, you know, the reality is he's a man who grew death row into one of the biggest record companies in history. I think 
back in the day, it was like 200 million plus per year. And I don't think we hear enough about his business mind. Can you tell us some of the qualities that made him such a successful businessman? Yeah, uh, Chill was a smart guy, bro. He's he's a he's an intelligent man. He's a go getter. <laughs> yeah, he took us from not having anything, you know, to like you said, two hundred million dollars, and and you don't do that just by, by happenstance. Um, and so him and a guy named Dick, Dick Griffey that put in a lot of early work to get us in a place where we could do those things, and and we owe them both. You know, what I mean, I don't have any any negative uh opinions of Suge at all. He was my friend when we first started. We 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 had a lot of fun and we picked it. And and I, and I feel bad for you know for the situation he's in. But 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 we all have a purpose and we have to, you know, we gotta walk our walk. Mm. So nothing but a G thing and still Dre are the two of the greatest music videos of all time. And I can remember in 99 in the fall, I think it premiered on TRL because I think you were part of this doc, like bringing all the low riders into Times Square and coming up with Carson Daly. But more specifically, I mean, those videos define an era. And I'm curious for you, what was it like when you saw the treatment and, you know, same three guys, you in the back, 6'4 Chevy, to recreate that movement seven years later that fans like me didn't necessarily think was going to be possible. So that's, that's always Dre, right? Dre is a consummate big brother. Mm. And so he doesn't have to put me in these spaces where they make, where, where it feels like I'm supposed to be there, but that's always him. You know, it's always Dre Sam, where's Doc put him there? And we're gonna do it like this. So when you see me in the, on the, in the passenger side and this one, and you see me in the back seat, uh, that's all Dre saying, "Where's Doc at?" Hmm. Did did it feel seven years later? Like I mean, we only saw it with the video, but as you guys are doing recording that, you know, the conversations in the car, like, did it feel the same again? You know, like I know seven years isn't a lot of time, but that was a long time in hip hop. Just was the vibe like that in the car, bro? It's the it's the same vibe now. Mm. With, with, with the, at least those three gentlemen have never lost the, what what that is. You know mm. what I mean? He, even if we weren't in the best place, we never lost what that is. You know what mm. I mean? That's 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 just forever. You know, and the the way it works ain't the same, but the vibe is the same. You know, mm. when I go around now. It's not, I don't go to write, I just go to be there and and be an energy in the room and look at people and you know it's a it's a weird kind of kind of thing, but uh but I love it. It's still strong. Yeah. You know, Snoop Snoop did an interview with Big Boy recently that was incredible. I'm not sure if you caught it, but he talked about this weekend in the studio with you and Dre that changed his life. I think it's the first time he was in the studio with you guys. And he said he had been about to sign with Above the Law, like just like a couple days after that. But that moment in the studio changed the direction of West Coast hip hop, really, because he decided to sign with you guys. So you remember that? You know, what do you remember about the, the first times you guys were in the studio together? Well, I, I remember Snoop, you know, uh, Snoop came in and, and he was quiet, you know, and uh Dre put up a thing and he spit some stuff to it. It wasn't a whole lot of uh, extras on it. Um, and Dre beat him like that. That's it. It wasn't a whole lot of hoopla. Dre sort of made a decision that he's the guy. And, and we put all our energy into him being the guy. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys being two of the more prolific writers in the camp, was there a competition there between you two? Oh, no. Um, I, I, for me, it was a job mm. to be there to make him great. Mm. So it wasn't even about me anything. It's about me helping him to be great. This is this was his deal, and my job is to help him the same way I was trying to help easy or help you know those other guys. It, it becomes less about me and more about them because if they win, then I automatically. Mm. 
Mm. You know, you so had, oh, go, go ahead. ahead go ahead, Jay. No, I'm curious. You know, we know the the associations that you've had, but as one of the greatest coaches, you know, and one of the greatest songwriters, do you have people, be it on social media or that you might meet at a function that come to you and I, you know, and and ask you on the regular, like, hey, can you make me a better writer? Can you coach me? I'm just curious how those conversations play out. You know, just just given all that you've done for these stars. No, that that, that generally don't happen. Uh, it does, you know, every now and then you'll, you'll get something like that, but generally it doesn't because most artists think they're already good, you know. They think they got it. So they don't need nobody telling them what to do because all their fans is telling them they the shit, you know. Mm. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't matter who it is. If they ask me for help, I try to help people. That's generally the kind of person I am, mm. you know. And writing raps is a really small thing. And, and I mean, if I'm not doing shit, you know, I can help them out. Mm. Uh, but, you know, people don't usually, you know, ask for to put your help writing their songs. Got you. So the grand finale is one of my favorite songs of all time, you know, and a lot of people think it's one of the greatest posse cuts, too. What can you tell us about the making of that record? Well, no, that was not that was about that was a. That was a fight. That was a battle right there. Okay. <laughs> because that was my record, and it was every man fell for that scene, right? Uh, except for I got two shots at it because I wrote for two of them. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. uh, but it was, yeah, but it's a great song, man. You know, young guys having fun. Uh, thinking back on that, those things today. Uh, you know, it's just a blessing to be there, bro. And and I'm hopeful one day I get to tell that story. You know, let folks see that journey. Um, first, you got to see this documentary, bro. Okay. Okay. Got you. You said you wrote two verses. Did you write yours in the easies? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, man. That easy very Wow. Uh, Fuck a car, do a motherfucking walk by. Come on, man. Like, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, okay, let me ask you, which, which one of those verses you think was better, yours or, or, the, or the one you wrote for him? Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> so you said uh, you said on the co-defendants it was one take. With something like that, I mean, in the studio, first of all, were you guys all together? I know people had busy schedules. And, and are we looking at a lot of takes, or was it quick like that? Yeah, it was, it was a couple passes, really. And uh, but for me, it was just because I had just written the rap. I was trying to, you know, get it and learn it good. Uh, but but Mike liked it, and there was nobody there but me and Mike. Uh, and they were they were in Dallas for a show that night. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so it was fun to the side right? and we went and knocked it out. And then I went to a show later on that night and they let me sing the little white dance with them, which was which was a highlight uh, for me, I think, uh, in my in my musical career. I I'd never never thought I'd be on stage singing Kill All the White Man to a bunch of white men. It was <laughs> it was it was you know, you talked about uh, not expecting the reaction to God. When did you realize how much love, you know, it was getting? Well, you know, that when they released the little video part, Snoop retweeted the video, and then Badu retweeted the video. Nice. And, uh, and, and they don't usually, you know, Especially by do she doesn't usually do do stuff like that, and so and when I saw her, she was really tripping out over the over the the verse, and people had been commenting on the verse, and I'm like, damn, you know, I wasn't even trying, so maybe I should try. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just feel blessed, bro. You know, yeah, uh, happy absolutely. To absolutely. You know, so Jake and I, we're, we're doing, uh, Ambrosia for Heads is doing a partnership with BET. 
and it's a celebration. You know, hip hop is competitive, right? So we're letting the fans decide who's the greatest rap crew of all time. And, you know, every day they go on and vote and we have different battles. So one of the ones coming up is Death Row versus NWA and the Posse. And so you as a member of both, which one of those crews, if you had to put them head to head, would you pick? Oh, oh man, that's cold. That is cold blooded. <laughs> oh. Yeah, man. I can't call it. I can't call it because if you got an NWA and the boss, you got young Cube and young Doc and yeah. young Dre. Yeah. And real. I mean, that's, that's ugly. You know? But yeah, bro, you got, well, the Doc voice is gone, but you still got Doc. You got old Dre and young Snoop Dogg. And yeah. Corrupt. Corrupt the dads, if you will. Pac. So, that's a tough call. Mm. All right. All right. We'll let you know how that one plays out. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> yeah. Doc, if I can ask you one real question. You just said something right there. And, and you know, you, you poked fun at a serious issue. You said the voice is gone. And the question that I've never heard you speak on is, you know, the movie CB4 came out. Chris Rock and Nelson George, two guys who I hold in the highest. They love hip hop. They make a movie that kind of lampoons NWA. But there's a character in there that lost his voice. And I'm just curious for you, especially when that movie was new, you're two, three years out from a really tragic incident. How did you process that if you saw the film at the time? Yeah, if I'm being honest, and generally I like to, I noticed it and felt the sting of it. But I think I just. Nobody ever said anything to me, so I just let it be, you know. But I saw it and felt it. Yeah. And, and I didn't think the shit was cool, but, you know, it's a movie. What You know, what are you going to do? Hmm. Um, nobody ever said nothing to me about it. Yeah. As Thank a you. flip side, you know, uh, in 2004, you get a shout out from one of the MCs that people see as one of the potential goats now is Jay-Z, you know, similar to the let us, no one could do it better. How did that make you feel? Oh man, that was dope. I've, I've, I've always been a fan of the brother. And, uh, you know, he is arguably, you know, one of the greatest of all time. And when he did that, I started getting called from, from all over the goddamn place. People sending me texts and shit. And it's cool, bro, because, you know, periodically that'll happen and it keeps sort of keeps me relevant. And it says that the people appreciate what I've done. And so I take it as, as a sign of respect and I'm really appreciative of it. Hmm. Absolutely. You know, so your documentary is coming um, and those words hold a lot of weight. It's going to be one of the, maybe the best music documentary I've Ever. Like, I, I can't wait to see that one that's Bro, really red. Go I'm ahead. not around with you. Yeah. I'm telling you, when I tell you this, it doesn't even play like a documentary. It plays like a feature film. Oh, man. Oh, oh man. I, I cannot wait. We've been, we've been salivating really since last year. Like, we've been covering it, waiting, seeing the clips and all that stuff. So, can't wait. You know, um, one that's out now that's really struck a chord with me is Dear Mama. I don't know if you've yeah. caught that, but, you know, out of all the stories we've heard about Pac over the last 25 years, there's still new stuff coming out that's really, really strong. You know, um, what's something that you can share about him that maybe hasn't gotten light? You know, I wasn't as close to Pac. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time around one another because of our, our mutual friends and stuff. But I was in a shell, you know, when Pac first came, I was the king. Um, but, by, but by the time he had grown into his his space, the accident had happened and I was kind of in a shell, you know. And so I didn't I didn't really do well with people outside of the circle I was in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so out of all the classic songs you've written over the years, which ones right now today would you say are your favorites?
all of G thing is pretty special because of how, how it how it happened. But but bro, I'm loving it. I'm thankful for the opportunity to have done it. You know, TOD didn't have to put me with these guys and allow me to have uh, those drums and be able to sharpen my my tool with Q, with Ice Cube and, you know, have these opportunities to be heard all over the place, you know? And so I'm thankful and grateful for the shit, bro. And I'm grateful for that past of my, my, my eyes on the future because I can see a bigger and a better one than, than there has been in the past. I can see a new, like a fork in the road, like, like, bro, I've been the king of forks in the fucking road. Trust mm -hmm. me when I tell you this. Mm -hmm. And we're at a fork in the road right now. I can see things changing for the better for us in this space. It's another reason why I can't let them fuck the documentary off, you know what I mean? They, they might be trying to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I got to stand up for this because it's our turn. You know, it's our turn. It's our turn to get it back. To use it to benefit ourselves and our communities, our families, and our children, um, because time is short. But I'm holding that them dollars up to your ear and, and that whole sort of mentality of, of the way we do things is yesterday. Like those dollars aren't going to mean much in a very short period of time. So you got to get on your P's and Q's now and figure out what we're going to do. You know, that's why I'm in it. But guys, I hate to, you know, jump, but I gotta uh, catch a plane to San Diego. No, <laughs> we were we were wrapping anyway. Yeah. We uh, we are so honored with you being here, and I'm so glad you know your value because you are so valuable to Ambrosia for Heads, to Reggie and myself in this culture. And thank you for the time, DOC. Absolutely, <laughs> can't wait for that document. All right, thank you. Peace, peace, peace.